Hello, uh, and thank you to the organizers of this conference uh, for inviting me. My name is Michael Caviero. I am a currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Peking University. Um, the topic I am presenting today is called Examination of the Term Miao Wu Ziran and its appearance in Li Daiming Huaji, Records of Famous Paintings of Successive Dynasties, the Influence of Buddhism and Taoism on Early Painting Theory in China. Uh, in Chinese, it's Li Daiming Huaji Zhong Miao Wu Ziran Fo Zhao Yu Dao Zhao De Hua Lun De Ying Xiao. So this topic is actually part of a larger project or area of study, which I have been uh, pursuing for several years, including during my doctoral work, uh, which basically includes uh, a study of the historical interaction uh, of Buddhism and, and Chinese painting history. But unlike most studies uh, in this area, which are more object-based, my particular focus is on the early textual uh, history of these texts on Chinese painting theory, early painting theory, and specifically the language found in these texts and how it was affected, uh, namely by the dissemination of Buddhism in China in the early, in these early Chinese translation texts, this kind of textual language, and looking into the origins of these certain terms and examining their evolution into artistic uh, theoretical language. Um, so the topic, uh, the term that I'm going to be presenting today, Miao Wu Ziran, is also part of this type of uh, study. And the first time that we see this term appearing in a text on Chinese painting is in Li Daiming Hua Ji, uh, which was compiled by Zhang Yan Yuan, uh, active during the ninth century. And essentially this text was uh, known to be uh, compiled in 847 uh, AD. Uh, and as many of you know, Li Daiming Hua Ji represents probably the most important textual source on painting in ancient China, and is often considered the father of art history. It also happens to be one of the oldest extant art historical texts that we have in the world. Uh, so the term Miao Wu Ziran uh, that I'm focusing on is used in this text, namely in the second uh, book or uh, Jian, uh, and the, in the third section of it, on uh, which is titled On Painting uh, Materials, Tracing, and Copying. Uh, again, the title of this is misleading, but um, that's where it appears. And because this uh, text is obviously very old, there are many editions, but here we're, we're, named, we're specifically referring to the critical edition, which was published in uh, 2018 by Bi Fei, which is um, from the um, Tianjin Library, a photocopy uh, edition, block printed edition. Um, so we can take a look at the excerpt where this term Miao Wu Zern first appears. Uh, uh, so in this uh, excerpt, what we have is Zhang Yanyuan, who again is an, a ninth century a literary critic, art historian, and connoisseur of painting. He's describing Gu Kaizhi, who was a fourth century painter and is considered one of the forefathers of Chinese painting. And specifically what he's doing in this excerpt is he's describing the kind of state of painting uh, that Gu Kaizhi achieves in his in, in painting the Wei Moji or the Vilma Kirti, a Buddhist saint. Uh, so in this description of uh, the, the, the Gu Kaijer's painting, he uses a lot of critical uh, terminology. And we could see that Zhang Yuan is actually using a lot of special terminology that, that derives from other sources. But today, I'm particularly going to focus in on uh, this particular term, paying more attention to this special compound, Miao Wu Ziran. And specifically, I want to trace its origins in order to better understand its subtext within this Tang Dynasty nascent uh, Chinese painting text. So to do so, what well, what I've done is we'll break this uh, binome down into two parts, Miao Wu and Ziran. We'll first take a look at um, Miao Wu. So based on my examination, the term Miao Wu first appears in the Eastern Jin uh, fourth century text by Sung Zhao, uh, namely Zhao Lun, priestess of Sung Zhao. And, and it and appears in, the, in this text a uh, section called Niapan Wu Ming Lun, where Nirvana ha is unnameable. In, in part seven, Miao Cun, Nirvana is mysteriously present. So this text uh, here reads, Ran zhe xuan dao zai yu miao wu, miao wu zai yu ji zhen, ji zhen zhe yu wu qi guan, qi guan zhe yi ji mu er, so yi tian di yu wo tong gen, wan wu yu wo yi ti. 
Uh, so this part of the text is essentially describing how one would attain uh, or a path or a methodology towards nirvana. And in Sung Zhao's case, this represents the highest level one can achieve through Buddhist practice. So what we see is in this excerpt here, Sung Zhao is actually quoting two earlier sutras, namely the Vilamakirti Sutra and the Bao Nyu Su Wen Jing, namely, about, namely these two sutras' explanations of a, a concept called Bu Ar Jingjie or what we term in English non-duality or Advaita, uh, or these states of non-discriminatory insight, Wu uh, Fenbie. So for Sung Zhao, the term Miao Wu here represents an internal, what we call quote unquote, a confirmatory vision or a Jingjie of the state of non-discriminatory non -discriminatory insight. Now, in order to put this state of insight into a, of, or non-duality discussed in the Wei Mo Jie Jing into a kind of terminology, Sung Zhao coins or invents this new term, Miao Wu, uh, and they're, thereby imbuing it specifically with this new meaning derived specifically from the Wei Mo Jie Jing uh, context. So we can understand this kind of state as an inscrutable uh, uh, state that is found in an almost intuitive experience, which opens up insight into the so-called middle path. The middle path or non-duality is insight into this kind of name, same, sameness of existence and non-existence. Uh, for this the person who achieves the state, it's the subject and object are not no longer two. Uh, it follows that heaven and earth and he, the so-called uh, achiever of the state, sprang from the same root and uh, all things essentially come from this single one body source. So this is the kind of explanation that Sung Jok gives in English. Um, and so the person who achieves this type of state would essentially achieve this type of miao wu or wondrous enlightenment and it's you know realized state of uh, this realized natural state of Zen. So uh, after Sung Jok invents this term miao wu, this term actually becomes a very important concept that, that appears more and more in, in later uh, Buddhist uh, doctrinal texts. And as we see the following, uh, following the development of other Buddhist schools and teachings in China, this term continues to be expounded on, expanding its ex exegetical meanings. Some examples, including the following, uh, but again, are, they're not limited to these examples. So one of the first um, notable examples we have is Ji Zhang, who was of the, the Sui period, and it's specifically in his uh, Fa Hua Xuan Lun, commentaries on the Lotus Sutra, uh, and it's also in his Bai Shu Lun, he, he used this text. And what we see is essentially that what he does to, to explain Miao Wu is uh, he does so on the foundations of Sun Zhao's use of the term, not really particularly adding any new meaning to it in his exegesis, but he also uses the term to describe a mode of contemplation of emptiness by the Bodhisattva, Pusat Kongguan. And he also describes the Bodhisattva's two types of wisdom, namely the Shi uh, Hui and Fang Bian Hui, true wisdom and exponent wisdom. Um, in addition to this, we see the in Tiantai Zhizhua also uses this term in his commentaries of the Lotus Sutra. Um, and in his use of the term Yahweh, we mainly see two tendencies. One is uh, there's a continued use of this term like Sun Zhao, uh, who interpreted this, the, the, used this term to describe a middle, middle way or a middle road or a non-dualistic state described in the way Mo Jie Jing, um, using it to, to explain a kind of mode of contemplation used by sages, the sheng ren, xin zhong, so ju, the wu fen bie, the guan zhao. But in addition to this, we also see the term miao wu is now used to explain zhi zhi his own uh, methodology, this zhi guan uh, methodology, and specifically this kind of state of great enlightenment, da wu. Uh, and in doing so, he imbues this term miao with a more practical oriented definition. And we also see this because later in Song Dynasty texts, which talk about the Tiantai founding of the Tiantai, they also use miao to describe it as its kai zong mi yi. Um, in addition, in the Tang Dynasty, we start to see this in Huayan texts, namely in, in Cheng Guan's uh, commentary, the Da Fang Guang Bo Huayan Jing Shu. Uh, and he uses the term miao you know, also very similarly the, in the way that some Zhao, uh, Zhao Lun uses it uh, to describe a kind of um, impartiality or a non-differential uh, way of, of understanding uh, reality, both as an ultimate truth and a conventional truth that are simultaneous. So a zhen su shuang zhao. Uh, but what's more interesting is that besides using kind of the earlier uh, ideas about miao wu from the zhao lun, we also see that he traces the term miao wu to an earlier uh, iteration of its translation by Dharma Raksha, uh, which was termed shan jue or jue liao zhen di. And this is interesting because these terms actually, which correspond to miao wu, show that there is was a, an indic, a corresponding indic terminology, namely Subuti or Susik Shikta. 
So here we understand that Miao Wu, even though it was a synetic invented term, it actually has an Indic origin. Um, in addition to this, also in the Tang Dynasty, we start to see this term enter into uh, Chan, uh, Chan text. And really the first time we see this is, is in Yong Jia Xuanjie, his, his use of the term. Uh, and so what he does is um, what we start to see is that the term Miao Wu is used to kind of describe an ineffable, an ineffable experience of enlightenment. And in doing so, he uses it in conjunction with these descriptions of natural phenomena as a means to kind of describe the state. So it gives it a much more aesthetic kind of understanding. In addition to this, the term Miao Wu also starts to become synonymous with the term Dun Wu. So this is an innovation that appears in Yong Jia Xuanjie, this Chan text, and will later also continue to occur in Song Dynasty Chan-oriented texts like uh, Zhong Jing Lu and Wu Men Guan. Uh, now, what we just saw here is how this term was used mainly in Buddhist texts. So in non-Buddhist texts before the late Tang Dynasty, when this term appears in Zhang Yanyuan's common uh, uh, Chinese painting text, we do see it appear in uh, the text called uh, uh, for, uh, the commentary of Zhuangzi by Cheng Xuanying. However, uh, based on my examination, it's not likely that this text was seen by Zhang Yanyuan uh, when he was compiling and writing Li Daiming Hua Ji, because what we understand is that um, this commentary had not yet been in circulation during the time of the late Tang Dynasty when Zhang Yanyuan would have been writing Li Daiming Hua Ji. So it's not possible that he was necessarily influenced by this. And what it's more likely is that his understanding of this term derived from Buddhist terminology. So based on this information, we can map essentially Miao Wu's trajectory up until this point when it emerged in Zhang Yanyuan's painting texts uh, and becoming a specialized painting term. From this, we also have a rough understanding that this term Miao Wu uh, identified a kind of high level Buddhist methodology or means of non-dualistic in insight. Um, so uh, besides uh, what we just saw of Miao Wu Ziran appearing in combination, Zhang Yingyun also uses the term Ziran in again, in this section three of his on painting materials, tracing and copying. But what he does here is he uses it as a means to describe a specific class or a pedigree of painting. Um, and he, what he does is he says, Fu shi yu zi ran er hou shen, shi yu shen er hou miao, shi yu miao er hou jing, jing zhi wei bing ye, er cheng jing xi, zi ran zhe wei shang ping zhi shang. So in order to understand why Zhang Yun would use the term zi ran and why he uses it maybe in combination with the miao, we have essentially we can we can break this down into three different perspectives. Um, the first is from a Buddhist perspective, the term ziran obviously in its very earliest uh, uses in Buddhist terminology would be used to kind of describe a metaphysical state. And it's, this has been kind of discussed by several scholars. It was also used as a kind of match meaning or a glitz in very early Buddhist texts, sometimes even using to describe the state of the Buddha himself or, a, or kind of doctrines of non-causality. So this is very possible that up until this time, this term, you know, used in a very special way in these painting texts would, would kind of have taken on some influence from this. Also, what we see is in the late Tang Dynasty, this term Ziran was appearing a lot in several Southern uh, Chan texts. And so again, like I had just explained, the term Ziran could also be used as a kind of synonym of Duan Wu. And we see this in Shen Hui's uh, text uh, where it's used to kind of describe this state. So it's very possible that Zhang Yanyin was also kind of very keen on these type of textual uses of the term Ziran and this influences use in painting terminology. Uh, another perspective is that if this had a Taoist connotation, what we really mainly see is how this was used in these to describe a state of sacred writing. Uh, and specifically, uh, uh, later, later us uh, describes this talking about Tao uh, Hongjin, how he used this in Zhen Gao, and it's used to describe this kind of very sacred uh, state uh, that's very similar to other terms like Zhi, uh, Yi, or Tian Jian. Now, from another perspective, is that Zhang Yanyuan was influenced mainly by earlier um, critical. Uh, theoretical uh, calligraphy texts. And, and one of the reasons is because simultaneously to his writing of Li Daiming Hua Ji, he was also compiling a text called Fa Shu Yao Lu. So Tanaguchi uh, believes that because of the fact that Fa Shu Yao Lu Li Mian has several uh, uses of the term Ziran also to describe a high state of uh, high degree or class of calligraphers, Zhang Yanyuan was mainly influenced by this use of the term. And so that's probably where he or how he understood the term. Uh, additionally, there was also because within his clan, there was a figure named Li Yue, who at the time wrote a very popular commentary of the Dao De Jing. And the syntax that he used is very similar to the syntax that we just saw in Zhang Yanyuan's text. And so one of the theories is that it's very possible that he was also influenced by this, although this text is no longer extant. Uh, another um, 
idea is that Zhang Yanyuan in using the term ziran and pinpointing that as a kind of class of painters or degree of painters was also synonymous with another term that was emerging in this time, namely the yiping or the you know, inescapable class or uh, un, uh, unidentifiable or, or, or non-nameable class of painters, this kind of class of painters that was, uh, was, was very hard to, to kind of classify and that was termed yiping. So some uh, art historians have claim that Zhang Yunyan using the term Siren was actually using a euphemism to describe this state or class of painters that was newly emerging that he didn't necessarily appreciate, but were too important to not, uh, you know, uh, to record. So um, what we can learn from this is that in Zhang Yunyan's use of the term Miao Wu Ziran, uh, what he did was he integrated Buddhist terminology and Taoist terminology. And what we can be sure about is this special kind of term Miao Wu Ziran, really Miao Wu specifically, its, its core originates in Buddhist doctrinal texts and had a very special connotation, which again was based on uh, the Wei Mo Jie, uh, Vila Makiriti Sutra, and this kind of non non-duality kind of state of the bodhisattva. And so what we do is in understanding the textual trajectory, we, we are now more clear and understand that Zhang Yunyan in his formation of these painting term, terminolo termin terminologies and vocabularies, he was very much exposed to Buddhist doctrine. And it's very possible that we understand how these kind of nascent uh, discussions of painting were influenced by Buddhist textual language and discussions of practice and how that somehow trickled into these early texts on paintings. This also allows us to understand that, that in the nascent period of Chinese painting theory, such terms were imbued with a much more potent kind of religiously based subtext than they were in later times when it, it became watered down uh, in what we see consecutive iterations of, in later generations, starting with the Song Dynasty and so on. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um,